All right, our first speaker of this session is Joshua Vermas. He is completing his PhD in biophysics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign under the supervision of Professor Ahmad Tashkorshid. And, uh, and Joshua has already completed two practicums, one at NREL in 2012 and another at Oak Ridge in 2014. So. Uh, hi everybody. So uh, as uh, the uh, as my introduction or as the introduction started, uh, I uh, completed two practicums, and I'll be talking about the work I did during those two practicums during my talk today. So one uh, was on uh, what happens when you oxidize cellulose and how it interacts with the enzymes that are involved in uh, degrading cellulose to create biofuels, and the other is what happens if you add lignin into the mix. Uh, and how that uh, inhibits uh, the, en the uh, action of these same enzymes. So uh, this was done at NREL and at Oak Ridge. Uh, so this is kind of a basic overview of the process. So Heather already kind of started it from the uh, uh, sort of reaction side. But here I'll be working or focusing on the biology. So what we start off with is a cellulose fibril, uh, and that's crystalline. And now somehow you have to create breaks in this big crystal. And that's done with an uh, enzyme that I won't be talking about. They're called uh, LPMOs, so lytic polysaccharide monooxygenases. They use a metal ion to catalyze the reaction to break apart uh, uh, the cellulose uh, crystal. And then this causes decrystallization. So here you see a cellulose fibril that's been oxidized on one end, and it sort of lifts off into solution. And from there, uh, the enzyme that I'll be focusing on, uh, these are the cellulases, can sort of latch on and start degrading the cellulose. Uh, so what, what these uh, enzymes look like in general, so Heather was uh, talking about Trichodermaricei cell 6A. I'll be work, uh, I've worked on Trichodermaricei cell 7A, so this is a different enzyme from a different family. And in this family, you have a carbohydrate binding module, which, as the name implies, binds to carbohydrate and makes, makes sure that the enzyme doesn't wander too far off from its substrate. And then there's the catalytic domain. And the important part to the catalytic domain is it has a cellulose binding tunnel in it. And that's where the, enzo, or, uh, the active site is and what actually sort of munches up the, the cellulose to glucose units at a time. And then uh, these two uh, cellobios monomers uh, can then be further uh, uh, catalyzed into simple sugars and then used to create biofuels. Uh, and in addition to the carbohydrate bonding module, there are glycosylations everywhere. So these sort of lighter colored things are post-translational modifications of the protein. So sugars are added on to the sides of the protein. And those, those sort of help it stick to um, the cellulose. So the way we, uh, we study this, uh, I do classical molecular dynamics. So unlike the quantum talks earlier, uh, I just have F equals MA, and my potential energy function is a very simplified one. So uh, we just have a classical potential where there are bonds between the atoms, and then there's an angle term to make sure that the atoms don't flat flatten up on top of each other, and dihedrals to describe bond rotation, uh, and then some uh, non-bonded terms to make sure that the atoms interact roughly correctly. And the uh, benefit to this is that I can simulate for microseconds, whereas the quantum chemists get picoseconds or so. Uh, so we get a lot more simulation uh, for the same amount of computing power. Uh, so getting back to the problem at hand, so like what does happen if the uh, cellulose substrate is oxidized? So you, like again, this enzyme oxidizes cellulose. And what that means is that your functional groups on either the reducing end, so this end here, or your uh, non-reducing end, so the other end of the cellobios monomer, uh, have different chemical structures. And this will uh, uh, engender different uh, interactions with the, with the uh, uh, cellulose, uh, or sorry, the cellulase. And what we see are, is that the hydrogen bonding pattern will then change. And because this hydrogen bonding pattern changes, we might, uh, we might think that, OK, uh, there might be stronger interactions that sort of keep, uh, or that, that engender, uh, what's the word? Okay. So that engender, uh, there's a specific term that I'm supposed to use, but all right, it's not coming to me. Anyway, um, anyway, so, uh, 
these hydrogen bonding pattern changes, you start with uh, sort of either in unoxidized cell, cell bios, you have uh, interactions to O6 and O, uh, or O5 and O6 to, that ar or to an arginine residue. But instead, if you now oxidize your uh, cell bios, you get a carboxylic acid uh, group on the, on the end. And uh, this forms a very strong uh, salt bridge. So it's called a salt bridge because you have a negative charge and a positive charge, and those two interact very strongly with one another. Uh, and what we'd like to do is quantify this not just saying, oh, yeah, there's this interaction, but what does this actually mean chemically? So, so we're trying to say uh, how, how much more does uh, uh, the oxidized form inhibit or product inhibit? That was the word I was looking for. Uh, product inhibit uh, uh, the enzyme relative to the non-oxidized form. And the way we can do this is with a technique called thermodynamic integration. We're using the fact that any thermodynamic cycle, so long as it's closed, uh, since free energy is a state function, the sum around that those edges must be zero. And if we do this, what we'd, what we'd like to do is take the non-oxidized product and see how, what its binding free energy is going from solution to the bound form. And we, we'd also like to do that for the uh, oxidized product going from solution to the bound form. But that's a very complicated calculation to do because there are a lot of degrees of freedom that you'd have to get rid of. So you have to uh, uh, start in solution and then bind it to the enzyme. That's a very difficult process. What we do instead is we take a shortcut. So we alchemically mute or change this non-oxidized form into the oxidized form and calculate, uh, calculate it both in solution and uh, bound, to, or bound within the cellulase. And when we do that, we can then figure out what the uh, delta delta G is, or what, what is the difference in the binding free energies between the oxidized form and the non-oxidized form. And then this can then be shown nicely in a table. Uh, and what, in this table, the positive numbers mean that, it, that the oxidized form binds less tightly, so it won't product inhibit, for, whereas a negative value indicates that it binds more tightly and would product inhibit. So the big number here, uh, is for the uh, carboxylic acid uh, uh, oxidized product, and uh, that has the largest negative uh, delta, delta G, which uh, indicates that it might be the most inhibited uh, or most inhibitory of the uh, uh, four oxidized uh, products tested. Now, that was what I did at NREL, and now we're kind of stepping into my uh, last year's practicum project at Oak Ridge, where we're studying what happens if you add not just the cellulose, which is shown in red, and the enzymes, which are shown in green, but in other uh, part of, uh, the, of biomass, which is lignin. So lignin is approximately 30% by weight of plant mass, and it's everywhere, and it's kind of like the glue that holds the cellulose fibrils together and makes it so that they stand up straight rather than falling over and being disconnected from one another. Uh, and what's important, uh, at least in terms of biofuel production, is, is when you add more lignin to your system, you reduce the uh, uh, hydrolysis yield. So the hydrolysis yield is how much of the simple sugars do you get f uh, based on the amount of cellulose you started with. Now, there are a couple, uh, two different main mechanisms that are postulated in the literature for how this happens. One is that the lignin will just bind to the cellulose, and then the enzyme coming in later can't find a place to bind to the cellulose and do its thing. The other is that the lignin will just bind to all sides of the enzyme, and, you can't, and the enzyme then can't bind to the cellulose either. So uh, our idea was to say, well, which of these two or both is actually happening? So. There was a big uh, uh, simulation. Uh, it was 24 million atoms, and it used up about 42 million hours of Titan. Uh, and it's about a microsecond long. And if you just kind of look at it, well, stuff's happening. But it's not clear what. So we, we have to go dig deeper into the data to see what precisely is going on and how, to, how can we answer these questions more effectively. Um, so there, there are three hidden lessons that I want you to get out of this. Uh, the first is that lignin will bind to cellulose and will do so particularly to the hydrophobic face of cellulose, and I'll get into a bit later what that is. Uh, lignin will bind to cellulases, particularly to tyrosine residues on that carbohydrate binding module I mentioned earlier. And the third is that the lignocelliosic mesh network formed will really hinder enzyme diffusion and slow down the sampling of the enzyme around, uh, around the cellulose. So let's get into the first lesson. So, uh, lignin will bind to cellulose, and it really, really does. So here, here I'm showing a plot 
of the number of contacts formed over the course of the simulation. So at time zero, uh, since we started from a, just a lignin cellulose system, there were already many contacts formed. Now, we, we, uh, the initial simulations had just one fibril. We have nine. So there are now uh, contacts being formed between fibrils. And so that's why the lignin to cellulose and lignin to lignin uh, contact number goes up as the simulation progresses. But the enzyme to lignin, uh, the enzyme forms more contacts to lignin than to anything else in the system. Uh, now, in these lignin, uh, lignin cellulose contacts, uh, the surface area that this takes up is very, very large, and its uh, lignin will occlude nearly a quarter of the total cellulose surface area. Uh, versus, like the enzyme to lignin contact area, there's not a whole lot of contact here, but there's a quarter of the total cellulose surface is just taken up by lignin. There's nothing you can do about it. What's more, uh, is that uh, it's localized to hydrophobic surfaces. So if you look edge on at a cellulose fibril, uh, there are two kinds of surfaces. So on the top and on the bottom are hydrophobic surfaces. And they're called hydrophobic because the hydroxyl groups of uh, the glucoses are, are pointing outwards. So the red, red guys are the uh, oxygens of the hydroxyl groups, and they're all facing out onto the hydrophilic surfaces. Uh, they're hydrophilic because these hydroxyls can now make hydrogen bonds with the water solution around it, and uh, that makes it so that you have many more contacts uh, or many more waters uh, on, around this, uh, the hydroph hydrophilic surfaces rather than hydrophobic. And what this turns out is that the, uh, both the contacts between cellulose and the enzyme and cellulose to the lignin, you make a lot more contacts on these hydro, uh, hydrophobic surfaces than you do on the blue hydrophilic ones. Uh, so our second lesson is that lignin will bind to cellulases, uh, particularly to tyrosine residues in the carbohydrate binding module. And the way we show this, come on, there we go, is we look at what is the enzyme binding to over the course of the simulation. So initially, they're all on this black line here. So they're all unbound. Now, uh, over the course of the simulation, they might either bind to cellulose, lignin, enzyme, or some combination thereof. Now, if you go look at what are the populations that dominate, it's lignin or lignin and cellulose. So 80% of all of the enzymes in the simulation will bind to either lignin or lignin and cellulose, so they all bind, or many of them will bind to lignin. Uh, and we can show this a different way by showing you a representation of uh, all the heavy atoms of uh, the enzyme, and then coloring them based on how many contacts they make to lignin heavy atoms. And you'll see that there are two areas that have a lot. So there's up here, these are uh, on the glycosylation, and down here, there's some tyrosines. Now, I can go into a bit more detail as to what they are, and if you're interested, come see me later, but I don't have time to go into them uh, uh, right now. So the uh, third lesson is that the lignocellulosic mesh network formed really hinders enzyme diffusion. So uh, this is a different representation of the movie I showed you earlier. Uh, what we're doing now is instead of showing a, a, an exact three-dimensional representation of where every single atom is in the system, we're uh, instead showing where every molecule is in the system and not doing it in a geometrically correct sense. Instead, each one of uh, these circles represents one, part of, or one molecule, and the uh, black lines between them are, indicate that there is a contact being formed between these two elements of the system. And, um, at, and these, uh, these contacts act like springs. So as, this, as, as the contact evolves, uh, there's a force being applied between these two circles, and that's how you get the representation that you see here. Uh, and as you begin at the beginning, or at the beginning of the simulation, there are very few contacts being formed. But as you go back through, or as this loop back, loops back through, uh, you see that more contacts are being formed, and that uh, these are sort of preventing the motion of uh, uh, the enzymes. Now, the sort of more canonical way of showing this is to plot the mean square displacement over time. So if you look at how far is the enzyme moving over time, uh, it starts, or you, you would expect the diffusion or the mean square displacement to grow linearly if you're following Fickian diffusion, but we're not. So what's happening is that you're getting to a subdiffusive regime where it just keeps going slower and slower and slower, 
Uh, and what this indicates is that as the enzymes are interacting with things, their diffusion is slowing down. And as such, they aren't able to find the substrate that they're interested in. Um, so with that, I'd like to remind you as to what this second half uh, uh, taught us. The first is that lignin will bind to cellulose, particularly to the hydrophob hydrophobic face uh, of cellulose. And that lignin will bind to cellulases, uh, particularly to tyrosine residues on the carbohydrate binding module. So this means that at the beginning, both models had some degree of validity. And it's not clear as to which one, or it's still not clear as to which one is dominating the other. And that the third is that the mesh network formed is really uh, uh, inhibiting enzyme diffusion. So with that, uh, I'd like to acknowledge not just the CSGF for funding, uh, but also my uh, advisor, Ahmad Takorshid, who let me go on these two lovely adventures uh, uh, to the west or east and everywhere, uh, as well as my uh, advisors at Oak Ridge, so Jeremy Smith and Lucas Petridis, and uh, my advisors at NREL, uh, Greg Beckham, Mike Crowley, and Christina Payne, who is now uh, independent at the University of Kentucky and is a CSGF alumna. So with that, I'd like to answer any questions you might have. <laughs>